I will try to illustrate what uh, we are been doing on the Trim family in my lab since uh, a while. Uh, so the, the Trim, uh, trim genes encodes for uh, uh, proteins that share this uh, tripartite motif at the end terminus of the, of the protein. The tripartite motif is composed of uh, a ring domain, one or two B box domains, and the coil coil region. And it's also the name of uh, RBCC for, for this uh, class of proteins. Uh, the ring domain, as all you uh, perfectly know, uh, is, uh, uh, is characterized by a specific arrangement of cysteine and histidine residues, uh, which are able to coordinate two atoms of zinc uh, and to fold in what is called this cross brace uh, structure. Uh, of the ring domain. The B-box uh, domain, B-box 1 and B-box 2, are uh, zinc binding domain as well, and uh, their uh, cysteine and histidine ar arrangement is similar, though it is uh, uh, quite uh, distinct. And recent data, uh, structural data, show that uh, indeed B-box 1 and B-box 2 also fold in, uh, in a similar uh, structure as the, as the ring domain. In human, there are now uh, almost 70 proteins sharing the N-terminal uh, tripartite motif. Um, and they are group, uh, grouped in, in different classes based on the presence of different C-terminal C -terminal domains. But as you can see, uh, the, the order of the domain in the tripartite motif is also always uh, um, uh, conserved with the ring domain, one or two B-boxes, and the coil coiled. The B-boxes can be present in a tandem array, and in this case, it's always B-box one that precedes B-box two, or if only one B-box is present, it's always type two uh, B-box. There are only few uh, members of the family, which are this one in, in red, uh, which have lost the ring domain during evolution. Um, of course, uh, as you know, the ring domain and the coil coil domain are present in several uh, different proteins, but the B-box domains uh, are the characteristic feature of this family, and they're only present within this arrangement in the trim family. Uh, we, we got interested in this, in this family now more than 10 years ago. Uh, when uh, at TGEM, we, we found uh, they found, actually, that one of these genes, MID1 uh, or TRIM18, uh, was mutated in a, an X-linked uh, um, genetic disorder, which is Opitz syndrome. But as you can see, the TRIM genes are involved in many different pathological conditions. Other TRIM genes are mutated in different uh, um, genetic diseases, like the limb girdle muscular dystrophies or uh, forms of nanism and in familiar Mediterranean fever. But then, uh, of course, many of the trim genes are also involved uh, in, uh, in neoplasia uh, development and, uh, and progression. And of course, the most famous, the, most, uh, the best known uh, trim family member is PML, also known as trim19, uh, which, as you know, is uh, found uh, as an oncogenic fusion with uh, uh, rara alpha in acute promyelocytic leukemia. But apart from PML, also some other trim uh, genes are fused upon chromosomal translocation in different kinds of, uh, uh, of tumors. But the, the trim proteins are involved in cancer not only as oncogenic fusions, but also uh, as either oncogenes or tumor suppressors per se. Uh, and often this is uh, context dependent. So some of them may behave uh, either as a tumor suppressor or an oncogene, depending on the, on the tissues, uh, uh, on the different tissues. But for sure, what is uh, dominating uh, the last uh, five years or so uh, of, the, uh, of the role of the trim genes uh, in uh, human conditions is their 
uh, impressive involvement in uh, innate immunity. And uh, this started from the identification in 2004, I, if I'm not wrong, of uh, TRIM5 to be one of the major restriction factors for HIV uh, infection. And then following that, uh, many other TRIM genes have been found to be involved in the restriction, in cellular restriction of several other uh, retroviruses. But uh, their involvement in innate, innate immunity is not uh, limited to, uh, restricted, uh, to restriction of uh, retroviruses, but also in a more general sense as uh, participating in the signaling uh, of uh, danger uh, of the cells, following both viral and uh, bacterial um, infections. So what, what I, I'm going to, to present you today is uh, an overview of what we are, uh, we are doing uh, in the lab. So they are quite different uh, aspects of the TRIM family. Uh, one part related to its genomic and evolution, one part uh, mainly dealing with their uh, ubiquity in ligase activity and uh, uh, a more uh, focused uh, part on the pathogenesis of the, of the Opitz syndrome caused by mutation in the MID1 uh, gene. Uh, so given the, the elevated number of, uh, of trim genes uh, in human, we sought to, to, to trace back the origin of, this, uh, of these genes uh, in evolution. And so we started to look for the presence of the B-box, which, as I said, is the characteristic domain of this uh, family. And B-box domains are not present in prokaryotes or in yeast. Uh, they are present in plants, but they are arranged in a completely different, uh, different way than, uh, than in, uh, in animals. And, uh, and so the, 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 the tripartite motif, so the, the association of the B-box domain together with the ring and the coil coil is a sort of an invention of the uh, metazoans. And then starting from the invertebrates uh, to the tripartite motif, uh, different uh, but a limited number of C-terminal domains have been added and this more or less have been, has been maintained uh, throughout evolution despite the fact that uh, in invertebrate as you see there are uh, for example in, uh, in the fruit fly seven members of the family and then going up towards uh, vertebrates and especially in mammals the number greatly increased to as I said in human almost 70, uh, 70 members. Uh, what happens when uh, we align all these members in, uh, in human? If we align the, one of the um, central portion common to all of the members, the B-box 2 and coil coil region, uh, this is uh, the unrooted phylogenetic tree that we get from this alignment. And this uh, immediately uh, shows a gross uh, separation of the uh, 78 member in two main groups of, uh, of trim uh, proteins. So group one, what we call the group one, is basically composed of many different heterogeneous kind of, uh, of trim, uh, trim proteins with, uh, that share different C-terminal domain, which are represented by different color of the circles. So all the different C-terminal domain are present in the, in the uh, proteins of group one. And uh, also in this group, there are both trim protein with one B-box, the empty circles, and uh, the blue circles, which represent those that also have, uh, also has the uh, B-box one uh, protein. So in this part, there are proteins which are, as I said, heterogeneous with different C-terminal domain. In group two, the situation is completely different. The genes of group, two, uh, group two are more homogeneous. Uh, also, the, the gene organization, the genomic organization of the gene is quite conserved with the uh, exon intra organization quite well, well conserved among the different, uh, uh, the different members. And uh, uh, the protein structure is also similar. They are all composed of a ring, a B-box 2, the coil coiled, and always the same uh, C-terminal domain, which is the price-pry uh, domain. Um, 
if we go back to see where the invertebrate uh, trim genes are uh, uh, falling within these two groups, it is clear that they are falling in this uh, part of the tree, which is clearly the most ancient uh, uh, portion of the, of the family. While in these cases, uh, these genes appear to be only present in vertebrate, and they are more recently uh, originating during evolution. And some of them, as you can see probably here, they are very close to each other, and they are also clustered within the same chromosomal uh, localization. Um, and of course, uh, since these are well conserved, uh, what you expect uh, and what you find actually is that if you compare these genes in all the, the, the mammals, uh, you can trace a one-to-one -one strict ortology uh, relationship between the uh, among the different species. This is not true for group two. Here is a, a, another phylogenetic uh, tree upon the alignment of both human and mouse group two genes. So in gray, there are the pairs of orthologous group two genes, so which are present in mouse and, and human. But as you can see, there are some branches of this tree, which are completely, in the case of the red genes and these uh, green lines, which are completely human specific. So there are no counterparts in, uh, in mouse, which is something quite strange uh, if we compare mouse and, uh, and human uh, genomes. Um, so this would mean that uh, indeed the, 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 the human group two genes uh, are quite recent and, uh, and they uh, create, generate novel, novel trim. But this is also the reciprocal is true. So if you go to the mouse, also the mouse possess some private group two genes. And this is even more clear if you go back in evolution to non-mammals vertebrate uh, in which group two genes uh, uh, completely diverged. And uh, in the puffer fish and in chicken, there are a group of genes uh, belonging to group two as a structure, but completely unrelated to, for example, the human uh, counterpart. And this is uh, probably due to the fact that uh, these genes of uh, the group two are evolving much faster than the other. One of the classical uh, parameters for testing this uh, speed of evolution is to uh, analyze what is known as Ka on Ks ratio. Uh, basically, what you calculate is the uh, rate of non-synonymous changes versus uh, the, the, the rate of synonymous changes comparing two orthologous genes between two different uh, species. And when we did uh, this uh, on, uh, on, um, on the mouse uh, and human trim pairs, what we found is that group one has a very low uh, value of this ratio, which is consistent with the fact that the synonymous changes are higher than non-synonymous changes, and the genes uh, are subjected to what it, what is called the purifying selection. So the genes have their own function and they are, during evolution, kept to maintain the same function without not too much uh, um, uh, changes. Um, what we observe is that for group two, this number is uh, uh, higher, is significantly different from group one. And this number here, uh, um, point 18, is the number of the average uh, uh, Ka on K ratio if you compare the entire genome of uh, um, human and mouse. So it is clear that group one, as uh, shown here, many of the uh, uh, trim of group one are showing a very low Ka on K, uh, Ks ratio, while the group two are going towards uh, the uh, uh, number of one, which is uh, uh, what is commonly thought as neutral selection. <coughs> so the, these genes of group two are more, in a sense, free to change and to evolve independently from their uh, orthologous, uh, orthologous pairs. And, and this is uh, uh, striking when we go to TRIM5. As I said, TRIM5 is the restriction uh, factor for, uh, for HIV in cells. 
trim 5 is not present in the, in the mouse. And, uh, and when uh, um, the group of Stramlau uh, did the, the, the comparison on Ka on Ks uh, uh, of trim 5 in different, in several species of primate, what they found is that this gene is uh, undergoing a heavy positive selection. So many uh, of the uh, even reaching uh, ratio of five. So there are many, many sites on this gene which are pushed in a way to change and to, to mutate. Uh, and these are not uh, distributed randomly in the, in the protein, but they correspond to the site of interaction with the HIV capsid. And these um, amino acids, which are stretches of eight or 10 amino acids, are quite different uh, in human and rhesus monkeys. And that's the reason why rhesus monkey can restrict uh, HIV, while the human cells uh, are very, very less efficient, unfortunately, to do that. And when they swap uh, these eight amino acids, they could reach the, the restriction also uh, from, the human, from the human gene. So to conclude this uh, evolutionary part, uh, uh, what I showed you is that uh, there are two different uh, uh, sets of uh, trim genes in humans that evolve at different speed. And uh, this group two is uh, uh, younger and rapidly evolving, uh, but also is rapidly duplicating. Now I haven't shown you, but there are some data showing that there are regions of the genome in which these trim genes are rapidly duplicating, and they probably uh, um, serves, uh, serve as a reservoir to create novel function. And uh, this uh, uh, high speed of evolution is quite characteristic of genes which are involved in innate immunity. And as I said, uh, before many of the trim genes are involved in innate immunity. And probably this reflects uh, the need to, for the gene to counteract uh, the different pathogens they encounter do, during, uh, during the, the, the evolution. And indeed, the, the group two genes are mainly involved in innate immunity, while the group one, the more conserved, are the ones that are usually mutating in developmental or some other basic uh, cellular uh, function. And here is just to give you an example of what I was saying that uh, now it is clear that many of the trim genes which are listed uh, here are involved uh, at different levels in different steps uh, of the uh, life uh, cycle of HIV, but also of other, uh, of other restriction uh, um, retroviruses. So, but what, what is the, the role of these uh, of these trim proteins? Uh, as you know, they are uh, E3 ubiquitin ligases. Just to quickly summarize uh, the, the process, of course, ubiquitin is a form of post-translational modification in which you attach the, to a substrate one or more uh, ubiquitin peptides, and uh, the, this occurs through the coordinating action of at least uh, three uh, enzymes. Uh, the A1 is the enzyme that activates the ubiquitin peptide, forming a, a covalent thioester bond with one of its uh, cysteine residues. Then this activated ubiquitin is passed to what is called the ubiquitin conjugating enzyme, or E2, again uh, forming a covalent bond to a cysteine uh, on the enzyme. And then the E3 ligases intervene, and they are both able to bind on one side the uh, ubiquitin charged E2, and on the other side it recognizes the specific substrate to be modified. And in this, uh, in this manner, they allow the transfer of the ubiquitin to the elysin on, on, the, on the substrate. And there are different classes of, uh, uh, of E3. The main classes are the ACT and the ring domain, and of course the trim family possessing a ring domain uh, belongs to this, uh, uh, to this class. One of the requirements uh, for a ring E3 ligases to, to function as E3 is, as I said, the interaction with a, an UBA2 conjugating enzyme. And as is uh, shown here in this non-trim uh, pro ring protein, the ring domain is here, and uh, this is uh, 
uh, one of the E2 enzymes and the binding occur uh, with, the, with the ring domain of the, of the E3 ligase. And um, basically the, um, the role of these E2 enzymes, uh, um, it has been neglected until uh, some times ago, until a few years ago. Uh, but now it is clear that the E2s uh, are main player in the ubiquitylation cascade um, because they, they are uh, heavily involved in the determination of the chain type, the topology, the length of the ubiquitin change to be um, attached to the substrate uh, and also to the processivity of this process. Because as you know, you can have a modification of the substrate with a monobiquitination or in a monobiquitination but in multiple uh, sides of the substrate, or you can have uh, different chains based on the fact that the following ubiquitin to form the chain can be attached to one of the seven different lysines which are present in the ubiquitin uh, peptide. So you can have uh, different topology of, uh, of, the, of, uh, of ubiquitin chains, some like the classical LIS48 chain that leads to um, proteasome degradation, but there are also the uh, LIS63 uh, uh, chain, which are mainly involved in F and FKB um, signaling. And then there are many other uh, kind of uh, topology for which the, the function is not, uh, uh, not yet uh, um, uh, clarified. So, uh, of course, now it is, uh, it is clear that uh, the, the, the choice uh, of the pair uh, of the E3 and its uh, E2 is quite important to determine the fate of the substrate. But uh, very little is known on how these pairs uh, are selected, how an E3 choose among the different E2s. You have to keep in mind that there are almost uh, 600 uh, ring uh, E3 ligases or putative uh, E3 ligases and 40 or so E2 conjugating enzymes. So, of course, these enzymes have to be shared among the different E3s, but there should be some sort of selection, preferential selection for some of them. So, so we started to, to ask, uh, uh, first of all, if th indeed the trim proteins were able to bind the E2 as a requirement for the Eritrea ligase activity, and if there was some kind of uh, specificity in the binding. So what we did uh, was to use uh, a binary two hybrid assay, which is summarized uh, here, in which, uh, of course, you cannot read them, but uh, here there are 40, two or three, I don't remember, trim, different trim clones. And uh, here you have 26 different E2 enzymes. And uh, of course, in yellow to red, there are the observed uh, binding uh, between the two classes of protein. And what we observe is that uh, clearly the trim protein have preferences in binding uh, two subclasses uh, of, uh, of E2 conjugating enzymes, which are the D and E classes, which are quite common classes of uh, E2 conjugating enzymes, but they are not able to bind the other common class, which is the L uh, class of E2 conjugating enzymes. And then they have, uh, some of them have preferences for UBA2N, and then we detected uh, more specific binding, for example, TRIM9 with uh, UBA2G2 and uh, TRIM32 with these uh, V1 and V2 uh, enzymes. Uh, what th this experiment also uh, told us is that, uh, uh, probably you cannot see here, but there are uh, four or five TRIM proteins with an asterisk, and these are the ringless uh, proteins, and indeed, in these cases, we cannot detect the interaction as expected. And even if we delete the ring domain from one that is usually having uh, a ring domain, again, we, we, we lost the, um, uh, the interaction with the E2 enzyme, consistent with what is normally accepted as a, um, the moiety of interaction with the two. Uh, the other important thing is that um, the, the role of B-box domain is still 
uh, totally unknown. But since this, uh, last, the, the data of the last year suggests that the structure of the B boxes is similar or are similar to that of ring domain, um, some groups are suggesting that they, they can work uh, as a, a ring domain. In our cases, both uh, with ring deleted or ringless protein, we cannot see at least with this kind of, uh, of experiment, a binding with the B2, uh, B1 or B2 uh, domain. So what's the role of this is still, uh, is still unknown. Uh, so to validate uh, uh, the data produced with the two hybrid uh, screening, basically we uh, selected uh, six uh, uh, trim uh, proteins representative of the different bindings we, we observed and performed a, an MBP uh, pull-down assays, um, uh, transfecting some of the interacting and non-interacting E2 in cells. And basically, this uh, MBP pull-down assay recapitulates what we observe uh, in, uh, in the EAST uh, screening. Uh, so with many of them showing uh, binding specificity for D and E classes, but not for the L classes. Some of them showing uh, interaction with N. And again, uh, this trim 9, which is specific for G2, is confirmed to bind G2 also in MBP pull-down uh, assay. And we can appreciate also some uh, quite specific uh, discrimination between uh, uh, it to belong into the same class, so quite similar to each other. And, and more importantly, this uh, um, coupling of trim and E2 is also translated in their ubiquitination activity. So these are in vitro ubiquitination assay in which the MBP uh, trim has been used as the only possible E3 in the, in the assay and uh, together with different uh, E2 interacting or non-interacting. And as you can see, this perfectly mirrors the, um, the binding of the, of the trim proteins with their uh, cognate uh, E2 enzymes. Um, of course, these are almost all in vitro data, and, and this, uh, this is quite far from uh, clarifying the uh, the in vivo role of these pairs uh, in, in, um, in, trim, uh, in trim activity. What we could observe for this uh, highly specific uh, interaction of trim 9 with UBA2G2 is that this is the normal distribution of trim 9 within the cells in uh, um, cytoplasmic uh, bodies, uh, and this is the uh, usually diffused uh, distribution of uh, E2G2. Uh, when they are co-transfected together, the UBA2G2 is partially recruited to the uh, trim 9 specific bodies, uh, which is not observed when we used uh, uh, an E2 which is not interacting with, uh, with trim 9. The other specific uh, interaction we, we, we observed, uh, uh, as I mentioned, is uh, those of uh, trim 32, with the V1 and V2 type of uh, E2 enzyme. Um, in this case, uh, the, the situation is even um, more peculiar because uh, these two E2 enzymes are non-catalytically E2s because they lack the catalytic cysteine, basically. And so to work, they usually are present as dimer with the E2N. So here is the... Um, structure of such a dimer, so one uh, UBA2N and in this case the uh, V2 are present as a dimer and one is uh, linking the ubiquitin and the other is uh, um, preparing the structure to, to, to present the other ubiquitin to, to, to the complex. And what we observe is that uh, indeed uh, uh, TRIM32 um, is able to bind in MBP uh, pull-down assay also V1 and V2. And this maybe is not only mediated by the presence of the N, because there are some other trim proteins interacting with N which are not able to, uh, to interact with V1. So uh, either is not mediated by the presence of the N, or in this case is uh, 
only strongly uh, interacting with, uh, uh, with DREAM32. And also in uh, ubiquity nation assay, when we uh, assess the ubiquity nation activity of DREAM32, basically uh, DREAM32 is a better it e3 ligase in the presence of both N and V1 than it is when N alone uh, is, uh, is present. And this is not true when we use DREAM18. So in the presence of N is a better ligase than when we add uh, uh, V1 to the, to the assay. Um, this specificity that we, that we observe uh, is also correlating with the, the um, primary structure of the ring domain. Of course, this has to be uh, better investigated, but in, uh, in, re in, uh, in black uh, there are the the ring sequences of the, of the trim proteins that interact with the classical E and D uh, A2 enzymes, and then trim 9 in red, which interact with uh, G2, and has this uh, uh, 72 amino acid uh, um, added with compared to the other, uh, to the other ring uh, in this loop from cysteine 6 to cysteine 7, basically. And uh, again, also trim 32, which interact with V1 and V2, has this uh, first uh, loop from cysteine 2 to 3, which is uh, in some way different from the ring of the classical uh, um, E2, um, trim proteins. So basically, uh, we, we confirm that uh, the trim proteins are able to interact uh, with a certain specificity with their E2 enzymes uh, and probably uh, hosting the substrate in the remaining part of the, uh, of the protein. And this uh, for sure leads uh, to protein degradation because there are now many data around uh, uh, showing the role of trim proteins in uh, um, target degradation, but also in an FKB b pathway. And possibly they might be involved in many other uh, uh, processes uh, um, ubiquity mediated. And I didn't have time to show, but uh, we have also some data and there are also some data in the literature that suggest that trim proteins might be uh, also uh, implicated in, uh, in sumoylation uh, uh, and also in, in ESGylation, which is another ubiquitin-like uh, uh, modification. Uh, of course, the, these uh, results then open many other uh, questions on the uh, real ubiquitin chain specificity. As I said, the role of the B-box, which is still uh, unknown, and uh, um, a further uh, complexity is added by the fact that uh, the trim proteins, one of the characteristics is to ability to homo-interact uh, and also in many cases to hetero-interact. Um, it is still not known whether they form homodimer, but the general uh, um, idea is now that they can form trimer as a, a basic uh, structure, and then this trimer can further uh, associate for, to form higher order molecular weight uh, uh, complexes. And so you can imagine that uh, here are, uh, the trim proteins are just represented as dimers, but you can imagine that now the problem is uh, this dimer or trimer, whatever it is, it is uh, binding the same E2s, different E2s, how they are, uh, they are coordinating in the function of, uh, of uh, the ligase. The last uh, part, I will uh, just quickly uh, told, tell you about the, what we are doing on this specific uh, trim, uh, trim genes. As uh, Mauro was saying, I started as a human uh, uh, in human genetics, and uh, so we started studying this uh, um, genetic developmental disorder, which is called Opitz uh, syndrome, uh, which is characterized by developmental defects uh, along the midline of the body. So these uh, uh, boys uh, show hypertellurism, which is this uh, uh, highs which are wide uh, set, uh, they often show cleft of lip uh, and palate, as you can see here, uh, to one of these two twins before, uh, before the surgery. Uh, laryngotracheoesophageal abnormality, as shown here with this uh, uh, cleft of the posterior uh, um, 
uh, uh, esophagus in, uh, in a specimen, an autoptic specimen, and then they also show some other defects, uh, among which uh, also brain uh, abnormalities. The genes mutated, the gene mutated in this, uh, in this patient is uh, MID1 or TRIM18. Um, what the, the pathogenetic role of this gene is not clear yet, but what it is clear is that the disease is due to a loss of function mechanism. So as a most uh, straightforward uh, uh, approach, we create a mouse model for this disease. Um, which is not completely recapitulating the disease. So we do not observe these gross uh, uh, defects along the midline of the body, uh, but is reproducing the neurological aspect of the disease. And uh, in particular, we, what we observe is that uh, this, uh, the knockout, mid one knockout mice show a defect in the anterior lobes of the uh, medial part of the cerebellum, so in, in, the, in the vermis. So, here, when you uh, cut uh, the, the section of the brain here, what you observe is that uh, uh, the first uh, one, two, and third lobe are uh, either missing or uh, strange in shape, while if you cut uh, in the lateral part in the um, um, hemisphere, uh, normal uh, foliation is, uh, is observed. Uh, these mice also uh, show some uh, behavioral uh, impairment. Uh, being uh, defective in the cerebellum, of course, we tested some motor coordination uh, um, tasks. And uh, indeed, uh, they, co they, they make uh, uh, more false step uh, in the walking wire test and they remain uh, hanging on the wire for less time than the the wild type animal. But they are also um, uh, worse performing in the, in the rotarod analysis. You know when uh, the classical rotarod, when the mice has to, uh, to walk on a rotating, uh, rotating bar without falling. And this is done in different uh, um, consecutive days. And uh, the knockout mice, uh, as well as the wild type, they learn how to stay on the accelerating road. But of course, they, as you can see here, they, uh, they show a much worse uh, performance in, in, uh, in learning this. And uh, this is, uh, the Rotarod uh, task is known not only to test for classical motor coordination like this, but also for some motor learning uh, skills of the mice. And, uh, and, and to, to go uh, forward on this uh, learning um, defects, what we, we did was to test uh, the spatial memory in this, uh, in this mice. So we um, food deprived the mice, uh, and then uh, we put them in a cross maze uh, in which their goal is to reach this uh, chocolate chip. And, um, and as you can see uh, from this uh, graph, basically the, uh, the knockout and the wild type, the first day they start from around, let's say, 50% success rate, which is by chance they, they got the, the, the right uh, direction. But then while the wild type animals are almost reaching 100% success in finding the chocolate chip, the knockout animals uh, are not. And this is not true when we test the animal in this other uh, um, task, which is exactly uh, comparable to this one in uh, um, motor requirement and motivational uh, demands. Uh, because the chocolate chip is the same and they are food deprived for the same uh, period of time. The only difference is that in this case, they have some cues to refer to. And, and this is, in this case, we observe no difference between wild type and the knockout. And uh, so this is uh, called an egocentric procedure. So in that case, the animals are only to rely on its own body. Basically, it has to know that the chip is on its own right, for example. <laughs> While in this case, he has to uh, sort of design a map uh, in his brain to, <clears throat> uh, to define where to go. And it is known that this uh, task here is mediated by the hippocampus, while this 
uh, task is mediated mainly by the cerebellum, so it, which is consistent with the defect we, we observed. So going rapidly back to the, uh, to the anatomy of this, uh, of this cerebellum, um, we, we just um, checked whether the layer, um, the, the, the cerebellum cortex layer organization was uh, uh, correct in our uh, knockout mice, and indeed it is, despite the fact that the, uh, the, the lobes are not, but the uh, molecular layer, external molecular layer and Purkinje cell monolayer are correctly uh, present, and also the internal granular uh, layer, suggesting that the problem as it is in the disease <coughs> it is a developmental problem. The development of the uh, cerebellum in the mouse is, uh, it takes quite a, a lot, uh, starting from E9.5 and is completed uh, by the first two weeks uh, uh, after birth. And, and so we started going backwards to analyze animal at different stages uh, um, of, uh, of development that, as you can see, starts from a smooth, uh, cellular, uh, cerebellar structure and then uh, going, uh, with the, going on with the foliation pattern which is typical for each, uh, each species. Uh, so to, to, to make uh, uh, a long story short, basically what we observe is that going backwards, uh, we realize that the, the problem in this uh, um, um, defective lobe formation is not due to the uh, fissure formation between the to form different lobes, but it is due to the, to the sort of an incorrect uh, um, boundary between what it is the cerebellum here at E17.5 with the smooth, still smooth surface, and the dorsal midbrain. This is the most <coughs> posterior dorsal midbrain, the uh, inferior colliculus, and this is uh, the cerebellum is the most anterior hindbrain uh, region. So this uh, uh, boundary here is, uh, uh, is incorrectly formed in, our, uh, uh, in the mid one knockout, uh, knockout mice. And, um, and, and what we, we observe is that uh, this originate around E14.5, at least it is morphologically visible at E14.5, and these are two markers, uh, OTX2 marking the dorsal midbrain and PAX2 marking the um, the cerebellum, and here is the boundary, and as you can see in the mid one knockout mice, this boundary is uh, uh, shifted and completely rostralized um, in, in this, uh, in this uh, region. And this uh, uh, corresponds also to uh, a down regulation of one of the creep layer in the uh, boundary between different uh, um, structures of the brain, especially in the anterior, anterior posterior definition of the boundaries, which is FGF17, which is one of the members of the subfamily uh, to, to which FGF8 belongs to. And uh, as you can see here, these are the wild type uh, animals at different uh, mediolateral uh, section, and here is the down regulation we observe for. Uh, FGF17, and um, this is consistent with the fact that FGF, the knockout of FGF17 is showing a lack of the uh, first lobe of the cerebellar vermis, so consistent with, uh, with our result. And so to, to, to conclude also this part, basically what we found is that uh, the uh, mid one knockout mouse line is uh, recapitulating the neurological aspect of the, of the Opitz syndrome. And indeed, uh, in patients uh, in which anatomical brain defects have been detected, uh, they always show hypoplasia of the anterior cerebellar uh, vermis. And what we observe as uh, mouse impairment, uh, uh, knockout impairment, uh, motor uh, learning impairment, can, be, can parallel in some way the developmental delay which is observed in, uh, in Opitz syndrome patients. So uh, these, um, th these boys usually uh, reach the uh, different milestones later on during their, uh, their infancy. And so what we are trying to do now is try to understand what's causing 
the from the lack of mid one which is expressed mostly in the uh, inferior colliculus uh, at this uh, e14.5 stages what causes the fgf17 to be down regulating and following that uh, what is causing the abnormal um, uh, the abnormal cerebellar formation and of course the other big problem is why we don't, do not get the full Opitz syndrome uh, um, uh, spectrum of, uh, of manifestation and we think that this is due to a compensation of another prim genes very close to uh, mid one which is uh, uh, mid two and we are now generating a double knockout, Chiara Migliore is generating a double knockout to study, to study this point. And uh, just to thank the, the people that did uh, the work, uh, all, all the people that worked with me in, uh, in Naples, and, um, and then Luisa Napolitano who did the E3 ligase uh, and E2 uh, work, who now left uh, the uh, the lab, and then uh, these other people that I mentioned uh, uh, during, during the talk with Melania, who I didn't mention, but he's working on uh, one, a mid one interactor that, uh, that we, we have found. And of course, the, everything was, uh, wouldn't be possible without the help of uh, Elvira de, Le de Leonibus, who's a, um, um, the, the person who helped me with the uh, behavioral uh, test of the mice, with Andrea Ballabio, with when we started uh, all this uh, project, with Ron Hay, uh, an ubiquity person from the University of Dundee, uh, with Silvia Onesti at Electra, with whom we are doing together with MEDAT the uh, structural uh, project. Uh, with uh, Stefano Gustic uh, at, at CISA, who helped us with the uh, uh, micro dissection, the laser micro dissection, and uh, Danilo Li Castro at CBM for the uh, bioinformatic uh, part. Thank you very much.